So no shit, there we were. Undercover, in the middle of a bunch of Xenos-loving traitors. And the main thing we noticed was that the place was almost exactly the same as a normal guard camp. Sure, it was a little cleaner. And there was a bunch of Tau tech lying around. But if you ignored the fact that all the officers were short, blue, and had drones hovering around them, it all felt completely normal. Everyone was doing the usual chores or drills, the gear was practically identical, and the food wasn't even better. It was a wonder that these people had even bothered to desert. They were still in the bloody army, weren't they? The first thing we did after entering was collect our teammates and verify that they were in as good condition as the infiltrator had said. Tink and Nubby were absolutely fine. In fact, they'd fallen right back into their usual roles when in base. Which is to say, Tink was in the armory disassembling a Tau gun that he shouldn't have had access to, and Nubby was sitting on an impressive cache of stolen or bartered goods in a disused supply shed. Nubby claimed that if he could find a buyer with actual cash, he was halfway to refilling our budget. Neither of them were trying particularly hard to act brainwashed. Whoever was the brains of this operation wasn't working counterintelligence. After they established that you were a guard deserter, they stopped looking for anything else and welcomed you in with open arms. After that, it was just a matter of parroting all the greater good stuff. You didn't even need to parrot it well or speak the language properly. If you screwed it up, they just assumed you were an idiot. Speaking of idiots, neither of the guardsmen had bothered keeping track of Fumbles, claiming that he wasn't in any shape to cause trouble. This didn't sound very encouraging, but Sarge refrained from slugging them, and we all went back to find our psyker before he did something warpy. We found Fumbles sitting in a circle of PDF troopers and singing, if you'll believe it. He was wearing the same dopey expression as the rest of them, and a sort of idiotic happiness radiated off of him. He happily introduced us to his new friends and asked if we wanted to lead the next song. Sarge eyed the large group of smiling armed men, then politely declined and asked if he could borrow fumbles for a while. No one put up a fuss as we dragged the psyker away, and we all kept smiling and nodding until we got around a corner where Sarge started quietly dressing down Tink and Nubby. Doc took a good look at Fumbles and declared him to be low on sleep, low on protein, and high on something that was probably a Tau drug tailored to help with withdrawal symptoms. He claimed that a little talking, some basic care, and a slow reduction of the detox drug, the bottle of which he took immediate possession of, would sort the psyker out in a few days. For now, though, it was probably best if he stayed in Nubby's storeroom when he wouldn't be missed. Our team finally collected, we sat around our dopey psyker and tried to plan our next step. Our end goals were still the same, find out why so much trouble had been put into getting the deserters out here to join the PDF, find out who the Tau that had led them was, kill him and every senior defecting officer as well as the rogue traitor if he was still around, in the short term, all we could think to do was fit into the routine in the base and use every bit of free time we got to ask discreet questions. We probably wouldn't get anything from most of the troopers or the Tau officers, but if we got access to the command building at the far end of the base, we might find someone who knew something. Over the next week, we mostly learned how easy basic training was after you had already done it once, and how awesome everyone thought the greater good was but there were a few useful things mixed in. We managed to spot the traitor general we'd seen on our last mission leaving the command building one night, learned that there were occasional meetings with the big league Tau politician in said command building, and found out that the Tau firecast who led this PDF army was a loan from the Empire and a personal friend of the politician. In fact, they were so friendly that a team of fire warriors under his command was permanently assigned to protect the politician. We suspected that the diplomat was the cloaked Xenos who had led the desertion plot, but weren't quite certain. 
we also had a decent lead on the rogue trader. Mostly, the camp was all smiles and songs, but occasionally the fresh recruits that were dropped off didn't fit in. They weren't put through a second brainwashing or quietly executed, like we would have seen back in the guard. Instead, they were put on a shuttle that left once a week and took them to a mercenary outfit outside the cluster. Sounded fishy as hell, but some careful scanning by fumbles proved the officers really believed it. So, if there really was a mercenary company, we figured it was probably owned by the rogue trader that had been part of the desertion plot. It's a well-known fact that you can't get much more mercenary than a rogue trader. So if the mercenary really was the rogue trader, there were only three things that we still needed to figure out. First was the location of the remaining traitorous guard officer. He was just a major, but he still needed to die. Second, we needed proof that the Tau diplomat was the cloaked Xenos, so we could be sure we'd gotten the whole set. Finally, we still had no idea what the hell this was all about. As far as everyone we talked to knew, the army's only purpose was to protect the planet from whatever was raiding the cluster. This sounded fairly reasonable, considering that even more raids had been reported over the months of our mission, and had gotten all the civvies worked up. But we knew it was at least partially bullshit. The desertion had started happening way before the raids, so there was obviously something else going on, even if we were too stupid to figure out what it was. Luckily, we had brought some smarter people along for just this sort of thing. We sent out the infiltrator with all of our data, and the adepts did a little digging. Mostly, they looked into the Tau politician, since he was both the public face of the operation and the suspected mastermind behind the desertions. According to them, he was an off-worlder who'd come from the Tau Empire, and was one of the guys yelling the loudest for the cluster to join or ally with them. As far as us guardsmen could tell, this made him an asshole, but didn't prove he was our guy or explain what was going on. The diplomatic adept insisted it all made sense, though. In the end, he had to dumb it down a little before we really followed the situation. And by dumb it down, I mean he sent us a vid of him acting out with freaking sock puppets. There was a blue sock that was supposed to be the Tau politician, and a tan one that acted as the rest of the cluster's political leaders. He seemed to be enjoying the fact that we couldn't easily leave the PDF base and throttle him. Hi, I'm the Tau politician guy who might also be the secret mastermind behind the deserters. Hi, politician guy. I'm all the other politicians in the cluster. We are scared because raiders have been attacking our planets. I think we should all voluntarily join the Tau Empire for their protection. We don't know. We like being independent and worry that either empire will change our way of life and start a war. Well, we have to do something to protect ourselves. There's no point avoiding a war if we all die to raiders. Hmm. If our armies aren't holding off the raiders and we have to join an empire, the Imperium is bigger and scarier. I don't think they would protect you. The Imperium doesn't care about anyone but humans, and I hear the raiders are all human. Maybe they even work for the Imperium. That's worrying, but we still don't want to join the Tau Empire. Well, I can't force you to join the Tau Empire, but what if you accepted their assistance arming and training your armies? You'd all be better able to protect yourselves, and there wouldn't be any big Tau Empire military bases to provoke the Imperium into war. That doesn't sound much better than our own armies, and it would give the Tau Empire a lot of influence over us. No, it is much better. With superior Tau weaponry and training, your armies can easily handle the raiders. See, look at my army here. That army looks impressive, but we still aren't sure it would do anything to stop the raiders. Watch, if the raiders show up near us, we'll kick them back off the planet and chase them out of the system. Hmm, if that works, we might listen to you about forming a partial alliance with the Tau Empire. Goodbye now. Ha <laughs> ha my master plan will make them all into slaves of the evil Tau Empire. So, getting our critical mission data via sock puppets was demeaning as hell but it got the point across better than the giant documents they'd originally sent. 
When the show was finished, we sat down together in Nubby's storeroom and chewed the situation over, trying to figure out what all the political info meant for us and what our next step should be. Sarge wound up deciding to go with Twitch's current interpretation of events, which, for once, seemed fairly reasonable. His theory was that if the politician was the one who'd orchestrated the desertion and dragged them all the way out here, he was probably behind the raids, too. What's the point of having an army if it doesn't have anyone to fight? This theory neatly placed all the blame on one person, so if push came to shove, we could just kill him and call it a day. Of course... This all sort of hinged on the politician being the cloaked Xenos, and Oak was probably not going to accept we were pretty sure as proof of mission completion. Furthermore, when we shared our general plan with the Adepts, they insisted that we prove that the politician was behind the raiders instead of just killing him. They said that, given how many people had died in the raids, it would be a huge blow against the Tau Empire if we could prove they, or at least their supporters, were behind everything. This sounded like the sort of thing the Inquisition was supposed to do, so Sarge reluctantly agreed, and we started planning ways to spy on the meetings in the command building instead of just blowing it up. Twitch was disappointed. Sneaking into the command building turned out to be much easier than it had originally looked like. Sure, there were Tau guards on the doors, and most of the staffers were slit heads too, but the place was cleaned and maintained by the recruits. At first, we'd thought that it would be necessary to get ourselves on the duty roster to get inside, and started figuring out how to arrange that. But then, we found out the guards weren't checking IDs, and apparently couldn't really tell one human from another. Hell, it seemed like their only real purpose was to keep anyone from entering the building armed, and they did that using a simple door scanner. A quick check even revealed that it was the same type of scanner we'd already fooled multiple times with scan-shielded bags and clothing. So yeah, it was pretty apparent that whoever was running security on this operation wasn't the brains of the outfit, or they were terminally trusting, or both. Anyway, we didn't look a gift horse in the mouth, and quickly put together a straightforward plan for getting what we needed and getting out. We would figure out when the politician was coming for a meeting, bug the conference room, record him saying some really incriminating stuff, go in after the meeting and retrieve the device, then hand the recording over to the adepts and see if it was what they wanted. If that went smoothly, then we'd be clear to wait for his next visit, then grab him or the trader general when they went to the bathroom, and have fumbles rip the locations of the rogue trader and the last trader officer from their minds. After that, we could just blow the entire building up and escape in the confusion. It was a nice, simple plan, and we'd have everything in place for our backup strategy of just blowing the building up. The only way it could go wrong was if we missed something major, or one of us completely screwed up. Unfortunately, we did both. The thing we missed was the fact that the politician's bodyguards took their job far more seriously than the other guards. When they entered the conference room, they didn't just do a quick visual sweep. They took out scanning tools and checked the place for power sources and data connections. Tink's little homemade bug showed right up and the scanning guard went over to check it out. Meanwhile, our entire team, sans adepts of course, was in the supply room on the other side of the wall listening in. Tink swore, told us we were busted, and recommended we bail before they did a search of the building. Nubby and Twitch were already halfway to the door when Sarge vetoed this and told Fumbles to take a shot at fixing things. The Psyker lined up his target using the visual feed and his own ability to sense emotion, then psychically commanded the bodyguard to forget what he was doing and go back to his post. He'd performed that particular mental trick twice already during our infiltration. But this time, right at the critical moment, Fumbles fumbled. Our entire room and conference room's adjacent wall were instantly covered by a sheet of frost. That didn't phase the bodyguard Fumbles had been aiming for, but there were a few other people in the room. 
while the other bodyguard drew his weapon and covered the wall. The firecast who led the PDF warned everyone there was a psyker nearby and told them to get out. Then, I shit you not, the traitor general yelled, It's Bane Johns! I told you he'd never stop chasing us! Grabbed the politician and sprinted out the door. It would have been hilarious if we weren't all so screwed. None of us even tried to stand and fight. We knew a FUBAR mission when we saw one. If they had any brains, their next steps would be to seal the base and start an exhaustive search for us. And if they remembered Bane Johns, they'd probably remember what we looked like. So trying to blend in like we had been wouldn't work. We either needed to make it out of the base before they locked down the exits, or find a damned good hiding place in the base. First thing first, though, we needed to get out of the building before we wound up trapped in it. Nubby and Twitch led us in an all-out sprint for the least guarded building exit. We were probably halfway to the door before the bodyguards or the PDF commander even thought to enact some sort of lockdown. Of course, seven men running through the hallways at a dead sprint attracted some unwanted attention, and we really couldn't afford to have anyone speeding up the search right now. The infiltrator plugged a dumb recruit who got in our way with his silenced pistol. Sarge's clothesline broke the neck of a second, and two Tau staffers died with surprised expressions on their faces and combat knives buried up to the hilts in their foreheads. Twitch and Nubby didn't even stop to pull their knives back out. There wasn't time. We hit the door about 20 seconds before the alarm sounded. The single Tau guard watching it started to draw his weapon. Then Fumbles did something irreversible to him, and he forgot we were there, and most of his childhood to boot. We all felt a pang of guilt from the psyker. Quick and dirty psyching isn't pretty stuff. But at least that was the last casualty. We could see the base's gates closing ahead of us. So at Sarge's signal, we slowed down, fanned out, and tried to look nonchalant as we walked towards Nubby's storeroom. There wasn't time for a long debate about what to do next. The options were, find a way out, hide, or fight to the death. Twitch suggested that enough explosions would distract the gate guards, but Tink shot that down when he pointed out that the perimeter drones would never leave their post. Nubby volunteered a few hiding spaces, but even he wasn't confident they'd hold up to a serious search. Tink and the infiltrators started putting together a half-baked plan to impersonate an officer and steal an APC from the motor pool then were interrupted when Doc sprang to his feet and told everyone to shut up. Doc told the rest of us there wasn't much time to explain. The only way his idea would work was if we moved fast. We grabbed what gear we could easily carry and followed the medic as he led us towards the middle of the base. As we half ran, Doc quietly explained that there was one exit that was never well sealed. Because it was supposed to be open to everyone, free of judgment or reproof. The weekly shuttle that took the few troopers that refused to embrace the greater good to their new life as mercenaries had landed that morning and was still on the pad. There weren't expensive drones watching the shuttle, or even Tau guards, just a pair of recruits who were supposed to ask anyone if they were really sure they wanted to leave. Doc figured that if we got on the shuttle before the serious search started, and the guards vouched that no one had come past them, then it'd be allowed to leave on its normally scheduled run. All we needed for this to work was a bit of luck, a little sloppiness from our pursuers, and for Fumbles to pull off two more pieces of psyching. At the back of our group, Fumbles realized this entire plan rested on him and made a small choking sound. We got Fumbles calmed down and took up position a little way away from the shuttle ramp. Each of us told the nervous psyker we believed in him. Then Doc gave the signal and everyone held their breath. One guard's expression immediately went vague. But as soon as Fumbles turned towards the second, there was a sort of dark foreboding. It felt as if everything was about to come crashing down around us. It didn't, though. The second guard's expression went vague, too. Then we shook off the uneasy feeling and casually walked up the ramp. Fumbles practically collapsed in relief when we turned the first corner. 
Everyone took turns quietly congratulating the little guy as Nubby led us to a convenient spot for hiding unofficial cargo on this model of shuttle. Our wait in that dark little compartment was long and nerve-wracking, but it wasn't interrupted. A few hours after we boarded, the shuttle started making its pre-flight takeoff noises, and we all started breathing a little easier. Nubby pointed out that it seemed fate was with us today and got told to shut up by everyone else. Since we seemed to be out of the woods, Sarge started thinking about the mission again. Despite all the ways we'd been forced to scrub the current op, the mission as a whole wasn't beyond salvage, and all in all, we were getting some good intel from this screw-up. In our minds, the traitor general yelling about Bane chasing us confirmed that the Tau politician was the cloaked Xenos. Furthermore, we were on our way to confirm that the mercenary company was actually the rogue traitor and would probably be behind the raids as well. As for the rest of our objectives, hopefully all the time it'd take us to get back from wherever this shuttle was headed, would let the situation groundside cool down enough for us to make another attempt. Of course, there was the whole traveling between planets without our own spaceship or funds thing, but that was just details. We could work it out on the fly. As we lifted off, Doc asked a question that hadn't occurred to anyone else. What the hell were the Adepts going to think when we just disappeared? He worried that the Adepts might actually do something stupid and try to rescue us if they thought we'd been captured. They really needed to be told what had happened. Sarge winched at the thought and pointed out that we couldn't calm them. The PDF jammed everything but their own well-monitored frequencies and our short-range comms wouldn't work in space. While everyone speculated on how much it was going to suck for the Adepts, and whether it was worth it to try and sneak onto the shuttle's bridge and use their Vox, Tink ripped out his comm bead and jacked it into the pocket data slate he carried. A few seconds later, he scared the shit out of everyone by yelling and jumping. Once Twitch and Fumbles had been calmed down, Sarge grilled Tink on what all the excitement was about. The techie triumphantly told us he'd managed to get a plain text message out on the public channel, between the time we left the PDF's jamming radius and got out of the local comnet's range. Doc congratulated him, and asked what he'd said in the message, only to get a lot of vague answers. Nubby yanked the data slate out of Tink's hands and read it to us. Mission went sort of... bad. We're fine. Going to space to hide, and... An Investigate. Be back in ASAP to try again. Tell Earthcast Girl I'm okay. Keep doing stuff. Tink. It was probably better than nothing. The shuttle docked after a few hours of travel, and we snuck out of our hidey hole. A quick peek around revealed that everyone, even the pilot, had left the ship, and no one was guarding the exit. We hurried through the hatch and found ourselves standing in a fairly dingy shuttle bay that looked like it was part of an Imperial-style ship. It had the prayer seals and skulls and everything. Tink made a quick check to see if we could steal the shuttle, but the bay doors were locked. Sarge decided it was probably time to do a little exploring and nearly headbutted a crewman as he peeked out into the passageway. The crewman didn't shout an alarm or act more surprised than you usually do when you nearly get a concussion. That probably saved his life. Instead, he asked if we were the last ones from the shuttle and pointed us towards the bay where all the other dirt suckers were staying. Before we followed his directions, Nubby traded the man some smokes for a rundown on the ship and more info about our fellow passengers. Apparently, it was just a tramp freighter that plied the well-mapped warp lanes in the cluster, and there were about 40 other XPDF on board. He really did say, about. No one on the ship really paid much attention to their passengers, as long as they stayed in their area. That suited us perfectly, and we happily went to join our fellows. 
It was remarkably easy for us to blend in with the XPDF. No one asked us any questions or even paid us much attention. We commandeered a pair of the partially furnished shipping containers that were acting as passenger quarters and made ourselves comfortable. A few hours later, we felt the ship's engines kick on, and that night we jumped into the warp, all without anyone saying more than ten words to any of us. We'd missed this sort of apathy in the PDF base. It was nice when no one gave a shit about what you did. Traveling to the mercenary outfit took four days. We spent them maintaining our gear and forming vague plans for the next stage of our mission. Our neighbors mostly spent them drinking to drown out the whispers of warp travel, casually bitching about how the Tau were a bunch of sissies, and speculating on how much money and sex they'd get as a mercenary. It was a very homey environment. When we finally exited the warp, a crewman came down and directed everyone towards a shuttle bay. The few XPDF who appeared to be having second thoughts, or were too drunk to walk there themselves, were dragged along by cargo servitors. One short shuttle ride later, we were in a bigger and much more grandiose bay, being welcomed to a new life filled with money, violence, drugs, xenos killing, sex, and more money. The mercenary really did make a good recruitment pitch, especially the part where he parroted the PDF's line about being free to leave at any time while gesturing at an airlock. By the end of the speech, everyone seemed to understand the situation and snappily fell into line behind a few grizzled veteran types. Most of the rest of the day was spent in orientations of one sort or another, and the usual army recruitment stuff. Uniforms and bunks were issued, schedules were handed out, and one or two random men were mercilessly screamed at for minor and possibly imaginary infractions. Sarge watched all this with an approval that was only slightly marred by the fact that the Yeller was a vile traitor to the Imperium instead of an honest guardsman. To no one's surprise, the uniforms worn by the mercenaries were perfect matches for the ones we'd seen on the guards in a certain villa. Between that and the night's festivities, we had all the proof we personally needed. It was announced as a celebratory post-raid feast. Don't forget to bring your best loot to show off. Some rogue traders really don't go in for subtlety. There was a speech before the feast. It was given by the rogue trader and involved a lot of words like pillage and plunder. While everyone else was busy listening, Sarge asked the infiltrator, who was the only one of us the trader hadn't seen before, to try getting close to the senior officers and find out where we were headed next. The man practically vanished as soon as Sarge gave the order. Later, we saw a familiar-looking server at the trader's high table, but we really weren't sure it was him. So while the infiltrator did the actual work, we enjoyed the party. There wasn't really much else to do. We ate, swapped some old war stories with the mercs, and successfully hid the fact that we weren't drinking. Much. Sarge kept an eye on all of us, making sure we stayed under control and covering for Doc when the mercenaries' tales of horrible violence on defenseless Xenos made him sick. The party finally petered out at about four in the morning, and we all regrouped with the infiltrator in a handy nook Nubby had discovered. He had three important pieces of intel for us. Firstly, our next destination was the pro Tau world we just left, and the trader, with his fast, navigator-controlled ship, was aiming to get there in two days. Secondly, the official commander of the mercenaries matched our description of the final traitorous guard officer to a T. Finally, the raid would not start immediately upon arrival. The ship's seneschal and the trader officer would be going down. Make sure everything is in order with our employer. Sarge thought that sounded like the ideal time to get off the ship. Slowly, in the wee hours of the morning, a plan came together. Mostly it was simple and straightforward, but Doc's suggestion for dealing with the rogue trader was downright evil. 
none of us could look him in the eyes after he made it. The boy clearly had been corrupted by his time with the rest of us. We had just over two days to get everything together for our plan, but we managed most of it that first night. It wasn't until about noon that someone finally started imposing order on the mercenaries, so we had a free run of the section of the ship, allowing us to get almost all the supplies we needed. Over the next two days, we used a combination of bribery, intimidation, and good old-fashioned lying to avoid most of the chores the other mercenaries were doing and wander around the ship undetected. Sarge split us into two teams for most of the work. He, Nubby, and Doc concentrated on getting everything set up for a shuttle ride with the Seneschal, while Tink and Twitch were escorted on their mission by Fumbles and the Infiltrator. Our time on the Occurrence border really paid off for us during those days. We found it much easier to navigate the ship than any of the other mercenaries did. The maintenance passages and little locked doors that the crew used to get around quickly were an open book to us. We just popped up in places that none of the crew even suspected a dirt sucker could get to. We made a complete mockery of their security, and accomplished all of our objectives without ever being noticed, much less stopped. Our preparations were finished well ahead of schedule, and at Sarge's urging, we all got a full night's sleep. Or as close as you can get to on a ship traveling in the warp, before a big day. The Seneschal, being a Seneschal and therefore the very definition of a crafty bugger, probably knew his crew and the mercenaries engaged in a little smuggling. He probably wrote it off as a perk of their job and turned a blind eye. So long as they didn't cause him any trouble, that is. What he didn't know, though, was that this time the little smuggling bay on his shuttle wasn't being used to transport a few crates of prescribed substances and weapons. This time it was transporting seven crates, each of which held a very uncomfortable inquisitorial agent. The smugglers didn't know what was in the crates either, but they'd been given clear instructions not to open them, and stood to make a lot more money on this deal. Upon landing, they were to take these crates to a certain supply shed, use a code they'd been given to get in, and exchange them for several of the crates full of PDF hardware that filled the room. The boys were professionals and did their job smoothly and speedily. Once they were clear, Fumbles gave us a signal, and we all emerged in Nubby's storeroom, which was a little emptier than it should have been, but it wasn't like we'd even owned that stuff anyway. The first, well, actually second, phase of our plan completed, we started prepping for the hard part. The first hiccup came when we sent the infiltrator to contact the adepts and retrieve Tink's drone. He got through fine, but the news he delivered wasn't exactly good. Well, most of the stuff from the adepts wasn't bad. They'd gotten Tink's message and kept everything under control, but there was a message from Weeboo as well. Apparently, several ambassadors from other planets in the cluster were here to observe the PDF, and the ex-inquisitor had tagged along with his delegation. To cut a long critique and rant short, Weeboo thought we were right on the money, but strongly urged us not to just kill the Tau politician after we got our data. He promised a major political victory for the Imperium if we managed to get the Blue Bastard on trial. So he wanted us to either capture the politician, or do something to prevent him from skipping off the planet. This complicated our simple post-evidence collection plan of just tossing a dozen frags in the room and escaping in the confusion. But Sarge ruled that we needed to at least try. The infiltrator was sent out one last time to tell Weeboo to have a holding area ready, and warn the adepts of the change in our plans. Then we got our gear in order, and officially started Operation Record and grabbed the Tau Diplomat, then run away. Admittedly, it wasn't the best op designation, but it was Fumble's idea, and we felt he needed all the positive reinforcement he could get for this one. We got into the command building again without any trouble. There were more guards than last time, and they were checking IDs now. But their scanners weren't any better, and they didn't have anything that could stop Fumble's. 
The infiltrator pinpointed the large conference room the meeting between the politician and the seneschal would happen in, and worked with Fumbles to distract the door guard while Tink snuck in, planted his drone up near the ceiling, and engaged its stealth field. Sarge quietly promised himself that if this worked, he'd actually forgive the techie for buying the thing. Once our recorder was in place and transmitting, we split up again and made our final preparations. Twitch and the infiltrator casually walked around the building and placed a several charges in discreet locations. Doc prepped a vial of sedative, and Fumbles grabbed us some snacks from the cafeteria. Finally, Nubby was given a pair of charges to plant on the front gate and sent to commandeer an escape vehicle. The Tau diplomat arrived right on schedule, and his bodyguards began scanning the room. Tink put the drone in non-transmitting mode, and we all held our breath. Luckily, both the drone's stealth system and the scan-proof tarp we were all hiding behind held up to their scrutiny. We congratulated ourselves on our wild success and settled in to wait for Fumbles, who was sort of passively listening through the wall, to tell us when to go. About ten seconds later, the Seneschal entered the room and had his untouchable deactivate his limiter. Suddenly, we all felt a lot less smug. A very, very quiet debate was held in that closet while the meeting started. We'd been originally planning to use fumbles to make sure we had enough evidence before breach and to pinpoint all the hostiles for a quick takedown. Now, we were going to have to go in blind and wouldn't have his assistance until the untouchable was dead. Of course, the debate didn't really change our plan. We were still going to bust open the wall, kill almost everyone, then run out to where Nubby had the getaway car ready. Those first two steps were just going to be a lot more dicey. After a few dozen tense minutes, Sarge estimated that enough time had passed and gave the word to get ready. Everyone picked up their weapons and got into position. Doc readied his vial, Twitch put his breaching charge in place, and Tink got ready to send the drone's recall command. Sarge held up a beefy hand and counted down. The last finger descended, Twitch hit his detonator, and a six-foot section of reinforced wall turned into a wave of shrapnel, completely shredding the Seneschal and the former guard major who'd been commanding the mercenaries. One down three to go. Before the gooey remains of the two men hit the floor, three flashbangs had entered the room. The split second after they detonated, Sergeant Twitch followed them in and opened fire on the guards in either corner. A second after that, Doc and the infiltrator sprinted into the room and gunned down the guard standing next to the dazed Tau diplomat. Finally, Tink entered the room, barely ducking below the drone as it whizzed out, and blew the head off the traitor general. Two down, Two to go. There were now five of us and four hostiles in the room, but we didn't know that. Sarge executed the wounded untouchable lying near his feet and turned to where Doc and the infiltrator were grabbing the stunned politician. He caught a flash of movement, heard a yell from Fumbles, then barely managed to duck below a stream of plasma bolts. Doc and the infiltrator weren't so lucky. Doc got hit in the stomach and went down with a choked shout. Next to him, the infiltrator lost his head with an ugly splatting sound. Twitch and Tank immediately turned the new threat and raised their weapons, but all either of them could see was a faint shimmer in the air. Acting in desperation, both troopers fired to suppress, then had to dive for cover as the invisible targets ignored their fire. We had two men down, one of them dead and the other gut shot and the rest of us were pinned by heavy fire from a friggin' invisible enemy. The situation was not good. It was at that point, right when we were kissing our asses goodbye, that Fumbles saved the day. The little psyker ran in, took a deep breath, and let out a deafening shriek, which was echoed by two shouts of pain from the far end of the room. The torrent of plasma fire stopped, and those of us who could still move sprang into action. Sarge grabbed the syringe from Doc's hand and tossed it to Twitch, who slammed it into the diplomat's chest. 
Sarge then tucked Doc under one arm while Twitch picked up the frail diplomat in fireman's carry, and Tink hosed the far end of the room with a wild stream of plasma. Behind us, Fumbles took another deep breath, then under the cover of the second psychic shriek, we all sprinted out of the room. As we ran, Tink grabbed the drone's controller and ordered it to follow him, and Twitch mashed several of his detonators. Sarge stopped for a second at the breach, then tossed his entire bandolier of grenades into the room behind us. Minus one pin, of course. The entire building shook around us as two different series of explosions ripped through it. One was an orderly chain of booms that sounded like an incredibly loud row of dominoes falling. It was caused by a neatly organized series of breaching charges, which opened a clear path from our location to where Nubby was waiting for us. The other was just 15 grenades of four different types going off like a string of firecrackers. It nearly knocked us on our faces, and hopefully killed the two invisible hostiles. Tink led our run out of the building, charging his plasma gun as he ran and neatly incinerating a guard who came to check out the noise. Sarge was behind him, holding his laser gun in one hand and spraying it at anything that moved around us. Next came Twitch, who was straining under the Tau's weight and shedding landmines at a rate about one per four meters in an attempt to lighten his load and stop pursuit. An exhausted Fumbles brought up the rear and did his best to disrupt any pursuers by throwing random hallucinations at anyone who saw us. Put simply, we left a trail of bodies and confusion from the conference room to the parking lot, where Nubby waited for us in our getaway vehicle, which turned out not to be a hover car, APC, or flyer, but a rather poorly maintained food delivery van. As we sprinted across the lot and piled into the shitty van, it became apparent that our escape was not going to go as planned. Not because of Nubby's poor choice of vehicle, but because the PDF troopers we could see around the base weren't acting like they should have been. This was very worrying, on account of how the escape part of our plan had always been sorta of shaky. It mostly hinged on us getting the hell out of there and going to ground before any real pursuit was organized. This may seem horribly optimistic, but remember that by this point, we were supposed to have just killed the PDF's top human general, political leader, and the Tau firecast who commanded them. Between the deaths of those senior officers and the trail of destruction our exit would leave, the chain of command should have been an unholy mess. Unfortunately for us, it was not. The problem was that the firecast commander hadn't been at the meeting. We weren't sure whether he'd left early or never attended or what. But he hadn't died in that conference room like he should have. So right now, instead of laying dead in a puddle of his own blood while his force dissolved into chaos and let us escape, he was barking orders over the general channel. This was a very bad thing. So while our getaway vehicle slowly accelerated towards the base's exit, Sarge's mind raced for a way to disrupt the PDF before we were caught in the middle of a literal army of hostiles. As he listened to the orders and questions flying over the PDF's comm net, a solution came to him, and he seized Tink's drone. A second later, Sarge realized that he had no idea how to use the drone and seized Tink instead. Tink's orders were simple find something, anything incriminating in the drone's recording, and jack it into the PDF's general channel. This wasn't the time to worry about keeping the evidence secret until the trial. We'd trade political bullshit for not getting killed any day. Tink was in a state of overloaded panic as he tried to do several things at once. He needed to rip out the van's transponder and autopilot before it was used to stop us reload his plasma gun before the next fight, and now he had to figure out how to make the drone play back its recording, then find an incriminating section, then figure out how to jack the audio feed into his comm bead. The techie froze for a second, started to babble a question about which he should do first, then Twitch yanked the plasma gun away and used the last of its charge to fry the transponder. 
ignoring the fact that the plasma bolt came within a millimeter of destroying the van's engine, it simplified the solution beautifully. Tink immediately started punching at the drone's controls while Twitch reloaded his plasma gun, and within half a minute, the drone was broadcasting over the PDF's channels. It took a little longer to find a good section of dialogue, but after a few false starts he managed it, and we all heard the Tau Commander's voice go panicked as he ordered everyone to turn off their comm beads. Sarge didn't have time to feel satisfied. He was busy applying his limited knowledge of field medicine. The Tau-style flak armor Doc had been wearing hadn't done jack to stop the plasma bolt. The gut wound went all the way through, but it had missed anything immediately fatal and partially cauterized itself. Sarge hit the medic with an ampule painkiller and another stim. That brought him back into focus. From there, Doc was able to walk Sarge through applying a dressing and blood pack, as well as treating a few minor wounds the other guardsmen had taken without noticing. The Taub diplomat lay in a heap on the floor and occasionally moaned or snored. No one bothered to secure him until a hard turn nearly shot him out of the half-closed door. That would have been embarrassing. Up in the front seat, Nubby was driving for his life while Fumbles rode shotgun. Well... Lay's gun, actually. But whatever. He'd nearly crashed twice already, and no one was telling him anything except that his getaway vehicle sucked. As far as Nubby could tell, the situation was slightly worse than expected. Only six men had come back, after all. But they had their hostage, and the PDF appeared not to be paying attention to the van anymore. He rounded a final corner and started barreling towards the main gate. Which, by some miracle, hadn't been closed yet. It looked like he wouldn't even have to detonate the charges he'd placed on it. And as the van sailed through the open gate, Nubby grinned and hit the detonators anyway. Just as a goodbye present. Nubby told the rest of us that it looked like we were in the clear. Everyone sighed in relief and there were a few high fives. Then Tink ruined the mood. He swore loudly and told us that the PDF General comm channel was closed. He started flipping his broadcast to other channels, then went pale and screamed at Nubby to go faster, as he heard the traffic on one of them. Apparently, the engineers in the motor pool had the commander's battle suit and devilfish ready. Nubby nearly put his augmetic foot through the floor as he stamped on the accelerator. At Nubby's frantic request for destination, preferably one with lots of friendly people with anti-armor weapons, Sarge calmed the adepts as soon as we'd cleared the base's jammers. The nerds were panicked, to say the least. They'd been watching the chaos unfolding through hacked vid feeds. Sarge filled them in on our cargo, location, and what we'd just heard would be following us. He requested that they contact Weeboo and find us hiding places, or get us some damned reinforcements. The adepts didn't even bother to tell us how much firepower or how deep a hole we were going to need. They must have heard the forced calm in Sarge's voice. He told them to keep the channel open for tactical updates, then let them get to work. Nubby somehow managed not to hit any of the other vehicles as we put as many kilometers and buildings between us and the base as possible. The slagged hole in the dashboard made some faint beeps as the transponder tried to report our traffic violations and lock down our vehicle before we killed anyone. It was a valid concern, really. We'd left about a dozen accidents in our wake. Finally, after several nerve-wracking minutes of reckless driving, the adepts calmed us back and began relaying directions from Weeboo. They were cut off by a shout from Tink as the Devilfish APC hopped a low building behind us, and started gaining ground on our shitty van. The APC didn't open fire on us, possibly because of our hostage or all the civvies around. Instead, they just steadily closed the distance and released a few drones. While everyone, even Nubby, was staring back at the approaching devilfish, Fumble's face jerked upwards and the psyker shouted a warning. So no shit, there we were. Trying to outrun a top-of-the-line APC in our shitty van, when three and a half tons of pissed-off Xenos battlesuit dropped out of the sky like a fucking meteor, and landed five meters in front of us. 
Nubby screamed and swerved the van as hard as he could, actually managing to raise the vehicle onto two wheels. I swear by the Emperor, one of our tires actually went over the battlesuit's head as we pulled off the sort of turn you typically see lightnings make. Everyone who wasn't buckled into their seats in the back of the van was tossed around like a cat in a tumble dryer. It was a bloody miracle that none of our weapons or Twitch's minds went off. As the van dropped back onto two wheels, Tink poked his plasma gun out the back door and took aim. For its part, the battlesuit was just standing there and staring at us, looking as confused as a giant pile of boxes can. Tink's shot nailed it in the right leg, reminding the pilot that stationary armor is dead armor, and the battlesuit jumped back into the air. A few seconds later, he came back down ahead of us. But Nubby was swerving like a drunkard now, and the battlesuit didn't even come close to stopping us. Sarge and Fumbles both poked their guns out of the passenger window and gave him another volley as we screeched by. What followed was like a demented game of whack-a-mole, except the hammer couldn't land exactly on the mole, and the mole kept shooting the hammer every time it missed. We were slowly wearing the bastard down with our volleys, but every time we dodged, we lost a little more speed. The second that bastard decided his hostage would survive the ensuing crash, he was sure to shoot out our tires or driver. Inside the van, things were absolute chaos. Nubby was constantly screaming as he tried to dodge, accelerate, and follow the adept's directions at the same time. Fumbles was trying to relay the battlesuit's movements while the rest of us tried to get shots off through the doors, windows, and occasionally walls. The Tau diplomat just hung in his seat and kept sleeping. Occasionally, his head would slam against the wall with hollow coconut sounds, when the van swerved hard. After a particularly near miss, Sarge checked the map again and decided we weren't going to make it to our destination. It wasn't much further, but it wouldn't be long before either the devilfish caught up with us or the battlesuit decided we were going slow enough. The only thing to do was try and change the game before we lost this one. At Sarge's orders, everyone stopped taking pot shots and got into position to aim out the front window. Tink was in the best spot between Nubby and Fumbles. Behind him was Twitch with the single-shot crack launcher we'd been hoarding for so long. And Doc and Sarge did their best to aim around the seats. Once everyone was in position, Sarge gave the word, and Nubby found a nice straightway. Stopped swerving, and floored it. The battlesuit took the bait and landed in front of us again, but this time we didn't try to go around. Two laser bolts, a crack missile, and a big old ball of plasma rocketed out the front of the van. It was an obvious attack, and the nimble battlesuit would have easily dodged it, but for a split second the pilot couldn't remember how to. The only thing that saved the Xenos' life was the automated point defense bullshit in his armor. The crack missile went off about halfway between us and him, but everything else hit him, including the shitty van. Being in a high-speed collision is not an enjoyable experience. Especially if you're not buckled into anything. We came out of that crash with about seven broken ribs, a broken arm, a plasma gun butt-induced concussion, and a battlesuit wrapped around the hood of our van. None of that was important, though. What was important was that the van was still running and Nubby could still drive, even if he could barely see over the deployed airbag. Those of us who could still hold our weaponry and see straight poured lace fire into the stuck battlesuit's head camera thing. It was thoroughly slagged by the time a hard swerve flung the battlesuit off our hood and into incoming traffic. We all ran to the back door and shot it a few times as we sped away for good measure, then noticed how close the devilfish was and slammed the doors before someone tried their hand at sniping. Without the battlesuit heading us off, it was a straightforward race between us and the devilfish now. 
They were faster than us and could jump over most obstacles, but they also had to try and predict our wild turns, and we weren't shy about taking pot shots at them or their drones. In the end, we were about 50 meters ahead of them when we made it to our destination, which turned out to be the front entrance of a fancy office park-looking place with a big flag over it. Nubby plowed through the still-opening gate, then screeched to a stop as he realized that the road dead-ended in front of the largest building. As we picked ourselves up, the adepts calmed us and said that we should be safe on the embassy's soil. All we had to do was stay put and let the politicians handle it now. Hearing this, Nubby popped out of his seat, leaned out the driver's door, and started loudly mocking the APC as it sat at the wrecked gate. This turned out to be a bad idea, as one of the drones overhead took a pot shot that he barely dodged, and the devilfish began to slowly enter the compound while fire warriors hopped out the back. We ducked back into our van and got ready for the shooting to start, but apparently the Tau weren't quite ready to start a bloodbath. They fanned out into firing positions and appeared to be having a heated calm argument with someone. The adepts told us to stay put again while they handled this. The Tau should back down if nothing pushed them over the edge. Sarge decided it would be a very bad idea to bet our lives on this, and quietly instructed us to get ready. For a little while, it looked like the adepts were right. A large number of soldiers... Human, Tau, and even a few Crute came out and faced down the PDF Tau. The hostiles were definitely having second thoughts, even with armor on their side, and we could hear Weeboo's voice as he browbeat their leader via the comms. Then the half-slagged battlesuit with the PDF commander peeking out through the chest hatch came rocketing in. We didn't wait for things to spiral out of control. Sarge gave the order, and five guardsmen worth of smoke and flash grenades were tossed in every direction. Under the cover of that barrage, we did what any red-blooded hero of the Imperium would do in that situation. We ran like little girls. While screaming. The nades gave us some cover, Fumble's partial cloak of invisibility gave us more, and finally we had the Tau diplomat as a hostage in the middle of us. We still took a hell of a lot of fire, though. The embassy exploded into a point-blank firefight around us, the air filled with plasma bolts as two heavily armed forces with no cover opened up on full auto. We couldn't tell who was winning or losing. All we cared about was running faster. Doc went down first, taking a hit in his leg. Without missing a beat, Sarge grabbed him by the collar of his armor and ragged him along. Next was Nubby, who got spun around by a shot to his shoulder. Tink grabbed one leg and Fumbles grabbed the other and dragged the little trooper along as he screamed and cursed. The final stumble was Twitch, who didn't see the embassy's front door in the smoke and ran right into it. Luckily, the politician absorbed most of the impact, and after two tries, the concussed trooper made it through the door. Then we were all in the clear. We were all bleeding. We were all hurting. But by the Emperor, we were still alive. Everyone started laughing and thumping each other on the backs. Then there was a large explosion outside, and we all sprinted farther into the building. Weeboo found us forded up in a walk-in freezer. We didn't let him in until he went and fetched us our adepts and a medic. Between the broken arm, shot leg, and gun wound... Ours was sort of busted. When Weeboo finally talked us out of the freezer, we didn't bother with formalities. Sarge just handed him the drone and the diplomat, told the adepts that they were in charge for the next 12 hours, then we all collapsed onto the first pieces of comfortable furniture we could find. Weeboo didn't yell at us for bleeding on his carefully arranged decor, but we could tell he wanted to. Twelve hours later, we all woke up to find that we were big damned heroes. It's not like we were against being heroes, but we hadn't expected to be Tau heroes. Weeboo and the Adepts had been busy while we slept. They'd been blackmailing, spinning, 
smearing, exposing, and all sorts of other political bullshit all day long. They'd set up a chain of events that would eventually end in an absolutely gruesome trial that no one in the cluster was likely to forget. It wasn't going to convince everyone to purge their Xenos populations and join the Imperium, but it would push the entire political situation into a vaguely pro-Imperial equilibrium, which was unofficially what the Imperium wanted out here. The other guaranteed end result was the death sentence of the Tau politician. Sadly, we wouldn't be around to see that. Three down and just one to go, though, even if it would take a few years. Speaking of the one to go, the rogue trader started heading out system when things went south. It seemed like he didn't want to stick around if there wasn't a profit to be made having his mercenaries die messily. None of the locals gave serious chase. His ship was faster than theirs, and big enough to inflict heavy losses if they forced a fight. As he fled, he sent a message to us. Well, actually to his nemesis Bane Johns, swearing vengeance. He vowed that since he still had his raiders, he'd carve a swath of destruction across the nearby Imperial systems in our name. So yeah, he mad. His message is sent, the rogue trader warped out of the system leaving us with the rather put-out adepts and Weibo. They seemed pretty broken up over how many people were going to die, and how it was at least partially our fault. We found it hilarious, though, which really weirded out the nerds. We didn't let them in on what was so funny. Instead, we asked Weibo to find us an astropath. A few hours later, we were all sitting with this astropath when the message we were expecting came in. It was a general distress call, asking for assistance from any Imperial ships in the area. Apparently, the rogue trader's ship had suffered catastrophic damage to its warp drive. Tink and Twitch high-fived each other, while Doc smiled sadly from his wheelchair. Sarge told him it was okay and asked if he wanted to leave for the next part, but he insisted on staying. We sat with that astropath and listened as the messages shifted from requests for assistance, repairing their warp drive, to panicked reports that their Geller field was failing. We listened as the requests turned to pleas, then to curses, then to howling demonic voices. Our astropath had to stop there for fear of demonic corruption. Weebu and the adepts just stared at us then slowly left to get back to their politicking. Four for four. Mission accomplished. Emperor, forgive us for what we did to the thousands of souls aboard that vessel, but mission fucking accomplished. Anyway, like I said, big damn Tau heroes. The Empire knew its diplomacy, and whether or not they'd been officially behind the politician... When they got reports of his capture, they went into full damage control mode. Most of it was disavowing the politician and anyone who ever had walked within a half-click radius of him. But they'd also spent an amazing amount of effort praising and publicly thanking us. Not thanking the Inquisition, or Weeboo's spy agency, but us personally. A bunch of ex-guardsmen who risked their lives and defied the odds to blah, blah, blah. We got painted as these sort of heroic deserters fighting for truth, justice, and our own personal version of the greater good. It was complete and utter horseshit, and our first inclination was to go out there and explain what we thought of their greater good. But Weebu and the adepts said not to. We wound up sitting there and grinding our teeth as parades were held, statues were built, and talk shows played vids of us and analyzed our motivations. There was even going to be a vid series about us, a fictional and animated one, mind you, but an actual vid series nonetheless. Weeboo said he'd act as our agent and send along our royalties to Oak. When the warp interference from the death of the trader's ship died down, 
we sent a message to the occurrence border asking for pickup. Then kicked up our heels to wait. Sarge, Fumbles, and Twitch kept busy helping Weebu with the mop-up and report. Tink hung out with the Earthcast weaponsmith a lot, but didn't suffer any Xenos corruption aside from picking up a fondness for the local animated vids. Doc and Nubby got to experience town medicine. They said it was quite pleasant, and Doc took notes while they worked on him. Unfortunately, while Nubby's injury was repaired easily, Doc's leg and gut wound would take some serious time to heal. He was in for a long stay in the Occurrence Borders medical bay. He didn't seem that broken up about it. When our ride finally arrived, we bid Weebu goodbye and promised to never come back to these worlds again. That made him happy. The captain himself was waiting for us in the shuttle bay. He said he wanted to chat with Sarge. The rest of us were waved away to go have fun or whatever, and the two men went off to the quiet corner to say serious words about serious things. The captain told Sarge that three of the other teams had gone missing. He'd actually gone out and checked when they failed to report, but the planets or stations they'd been working on were wiped out. Sarge shared our story of the rogue trader and his raiders, explaining how they'd been raising planets as part of a big political ploy. But the captain said it didn't fit. See, raiders left bodies, either theirs or their victims, but there were always bodies. Maybe a few of the worlds around here had been hit by the rogue trader, but someone was wiping colonies completely clean of life, and entire stations were disappearing. He'd mapped out systems that had been reported to have been wiped out, or stopped responding to astropathic messages, and a sort of pattern had emerged. A long, snaking line of destruction had been cut through the border worlds and the Tau Empire, and now it was turning towards Imperial space. To the captain, it looked like it was chasing something. He quietly told Sarge that Oak had bumped this up to everyone's top priority. There were very few things that could cause this sort of destruction and all of them were the sort of things the Inquisition had been formed to deal with. Sarge digested this disturbing news for a while, then thanked the captain, rounded the rest of us up, and got very, very drunk. <laughs>